Hi there, and welcome to a very special episode of the Praying Christian Women podcast. I just have the honor and privilege of being here with Kay Warren. Um, Kay is co-founder of the Saddleback Church with her husband, Rick. Uh, she's an international speaker, best-selling author, and Bible teacher who has a passion for inspiring and motivating others to make a difference with their lives. And Kay, thank you so much for being here to share your heart with us and with our listeners. Oh, thanks, Jamie. I'm really, I'm really looking forward to our time together. Well, in addition to being co-founder of a very prominent church, and many of you have probably read her books and, and know a lot about Kay, but she's also become just an amazing advocate for mental illness awareness. And um, it's deeply personal for her. And that's really why we have her on the podcast today is to share her story and, and really to raise awareness about mental illness and particularly how prayer plays a part in mental illness, whether you're suffering from mental illness or someone you love is, um, what role does prayer play? So um, that's where we're going with it today. So Kay, I just wanted to open up and have you share your story about how you became an advocate for mental illness awareness. Well, thank you so much. Um, you know, it, it doesn't feel like it was a choice at all. It, it feels like it was something that, was, that I was um, thrust into by circumstances. Uh, our, our youngest son, Matthew, was 27, and he died by suicide on April 5th, 2013, after living with serious mental illness for the majority of his life. Um, it, 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 it started small, if you will, but when he was seven, he was diagnosed with depression, and we didn't even know children could have a mental illness, or he might have been diagnosed sooner. We, we just simply didn't know. Um, and it progressed from there. And um, through the years, it just got worse and worse, despite our best efforts and Matthew's best efforts. And um, he lived with suicidal ideation for probably 15 years, a long time. And, um, and he died, I say by he died, he took his own life, but he died due to depression, you know, that, um, that unrelenting depression. And the day he died, I knew that God was changing the trajectory of, of my life. Um, up to that point, I had been a global advocate for people living with HIV and for orphans and vulnerable children. And I, I loved my life. I loved what I was doing. I loved the advocacy that I was doing. I loved calling the church uh, to care for people living with, with HIV and to care for orphans. And the day Matthew died, I knew that God had just shifted my advocacy completely to um, suicide awareness and, and mental illness. So it doesn't feel like a choice. It's not like, oh, well, you know, one day I just felt let, no, the circumstances of my life made it very clear what I was supposed to be doing. Well, I believe that this is a message that so many of us need to hear. And, and I just thank you for being vulnerable. This is going to be, I'm, I'm sure, a painful conversation, but thank you for pushing through that and, and just hearing the call that God has put on your life to do this. Um, well, thanks for having the conversation. Not everybody's willing to do so. So it's um, very significant to me that, that you are spending this time on your podcast to talk about mental illness. So I read a blog post of yours recently, and it was called Sitting on the Edge of Hell. And that's how you describe the feeling of watching someone that you love suffer through mental illness. And um, you shared what mindset you had to take or that you chose to take during, um, during the time that Matthew was struggling. And, and it totally went against a lot of advice that you'd been given. And I just wanted to, I felt like that's something that would really be helpful to share. Could you share that mindset, sure. how you walked through that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Matthew had serious mental illness, and I think that's really important to point out because um, I know we'll talk about this as, as our time goes by, but mental illness happens across a spectrum. Um, to say that somebody has mental illness, sometimes we think that means somebody like Matthew who's seriously ill or somebody you know we see that's stumbling on the street, homeless, talking to themselves, and, and, and that's not that's just, that's not so. Many people have mental illness and live very strong and good lives. Matthew had serious mental illness, which is different. It's more severe. And um, as such, his illness just began to dominate his life. It wasn't just 
didn't just affect him in this way or, you know, a small way. It affected every area of his life. And, um, and as he became more and more fixated on, on suicide and taking his life and that there was no, that he was never going to be any different. He was never going to recover. He was never going to be healed. He was never going to be able to live a normal life. As that, as that, those thoughts began to predominate in him, it just, it changed him. It altered him. It made um, sometimes him to be a little scary. It made him because he was pretty desperate and in despair and, um, it just became a frightening experience for, for our family, um, frightened for him, frightened for some of the things that he said that are actually hard for a parent to ever, you know, admit or say that their, their child or their loved one is struggling with very dark thoughts and, and impulses. And, um, and sometimes people, professionals will tell you that you have to just kind of close your heart against, um, your loved one. And, I don't know. I could see maybe if you were a spouse that there were some parts in which you might feel like you needed to to do that. But as a parent, there was just no way that I could close my heart against my child, against my son. And, um, and that's what I did call living on the edge of hell uh, because there were so many years where he was so ill and so, um, in such a dark place and we didn't know what to do, how to help him, how to make it different. And, and I had to sort of prepare myself for the reality that he could take his life, that his threats could someday happen, that he might truly, that today might be the day. You know, I just lived with that knowledge that today could be the day that he takes his life. And, and that's like sitting on the edge of hell. It's, Mm -hmm. it's horrific. It's just horrible. And any of your listeners um, that are that are parents know what that feels like. And uh, a mom who had a had a child with severe mental illness asked me that question, how do you prepare yourself for the fact that you think your child has the potential to take his or her life? And um, so I kind of wrote that that blog post in response. And I said, you know what, against all advice, I will open my arms and my heart to my child. I'm not giving up on him. I'm not leaving him alone. I'm not going to let him just um, deteriorate to the place in which he um, becomes um, dangerous. I, I'm not going to do that. I, I, I am his mom and he is my child and I will do everything I can to get him the help that he needs. Um, but it's a terrible place to be and, and serious mental illness puts parents and loved ones sometimes in these completely untenable circumstances, like, like you don't have any good choices. You know, you think, well, if I did this, then this might happen. And if I do make this decision, well, then this could happen. And you look at all the options in front of you and there's not a single one of them that's good. You're just choosing between truly the lesser of bad decisions or bad choices as it relates to your loved one. And that just leaves you feeling like you're sitting on the edge of hell. And it's a terrible, painful place to be. So how did that, how, looking back, you know, being able to look back kind of more objectively on that time, what, were, what was your prayer life like? And, and what advice could you give someone that's sitting on the edge of hell right now in terms of their prayers, both for their loved one, for themselves, um, or, or if they themselves feel like they are um, struggling with, with mental illness? Well, you know, I was just completely dependent on prayer and the prayer support of other people at that point, because each day just felt so desperate. Mm-hmm. And um, probably three years, I think it was probably three years before Matthew died, I was feeling so low, so hopeless, so depleted from this ongoing struggle you know, to try to get him help, to try to find something that would make a difference for him, that I, I just realized I wasn't going to make it even spiritually on my own. And I uh, took the risk of asking probably 10 or 12 really close friends, people that I felt would be confidential, um, who would commit to pray. And, and so I began to send out um, a prayer, you know, sometimes SOS emails to them, mm-hmm. Um, sometimes once a month, sometimes more often if, if the situation warranted that just said, would you pray, would you pray audacious prayers 
of, of healing and restoration for Matthew and prayers of wisdom and strength for us as his parents to know what to do, to know how to, how to interact, how, what help to seek. And if God gives you a verse, send it to me. You know, if God leads you to pray a verse for us, send it to me. And I had a Bible that um, I, I dedicated just to Matthew. And if, if there were prayers that people said, I feel like God asked me to pray this specifically for him, I would highlight that in that particular Bible. Um, I, I did two things with it. One, I highlighted it in this Bible that I planned to give to him when he was um, well because I really believed that God was going to heal Matthew here on earth. And so I had this Bible ready, you know, with, to be able to say to him, here are the verses that people prayed for you. Um, and that was one thing I did with the verses. The other thing was I, I made what I call a hope box. And um, it was just a, an alabaster box that, that someone had given me from a gift store, um, you know, not alabaster, but um, like granite. Um, Marble. Marble is the word I'm looking for. And um, it had the word hope uh, on the top. And I started writing many of those verses that people would send me on three by five cards and I would put them inside my hope box. And they became my lifeline. Those were, they was represented the prayers of people who cared about us, who were praying specifically for Matthew, who were praying for his healing, who were praying for our strength. And I put them in that hope box and I read them day after day after day after day. And they sustained me in the the most powerful ways um completely reliant on on the prayers of god's people my own prayer and then the word of god on those little three by five cards that i put in my hope box so i would tell anybody who is either living with mental illness or has a loved one with mental illness to to let go of your pride and and ask for you know some people that you feel are confidential and and who you can trust who will pray for you, who will, who will commit to go before God on behalf of your loved one. And then take those prayers, those verses, and put them in a special place on, because there are some days when sitting on the edge of hell feels like you're not going to make it out. And when you've got those, those verses that you know God has led people to pray, or they're ones that you've been led to pray, you go over and over and over. This. They bring such immense comfort and strength to get through another day to get through those really hard times. That's great. And, you know, that kind of brings us to the idea. I mean, you are in a unique situation. You and Rick live a very public life. So during that time, um, was this all completely confidential during that time? Uh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, it, with the idea that there are, there are women out there that might not be in the, in the spotlight quite as much as you, but maybe they're pastor's wives, or maybe they're leaders in their community or church, yeah. and, and they're wondering, how do I walk through this when I've, when I've got the spotlight on me? Yeah. Well, there is such a stigma around mental illness, and I know we'll talk more about that too, but the mm -hmm. stigma is, is deep, and it's, it, man, it's real, and um, we were fortunate enough to live because we have been so open with our lives at Saddleback and have never tried to hide you know, our, our struggles and our doubts and just real life from people. I feel like we had a, a really sweet climate to be able to be vulnerable. At the same time, Matthew was an adult. He grew into adulthood and it became his story. And, mm -hmm. and because we were in the spotlight, I didn't want the media grabbing onto that and pestering him. He was so fragile. It felt like that was the last thing he needed was to have any kind of media attention on him. Mm -hmm. And so I spoke of his illness um, in his adult years, a little veiled. When I wrote my book, Choose Joy, I talked about a family, an extended family member hmm. with a mental illness. I didn't identify, you know, that it was Matthew. So when he was younger, I did talk about it more freely. And the older he got, the more I felt like that it, I had to protect him from, um, not because we were ashamed, but because he was fragile. And I felt like he would have a hard time handling the scrutiny. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, we enlisted confidential people. It was not a secret among our friends, our close friends, close staff. It wasn't a secret at all. It just wasn't out there completely. And so I would say anybody who feels like they live in any kind of a fishbowl or any kind of attention, you know, maybe more than others, is to, if you feel like you have to protect your loved one's story because it's their story, mm -hmm. that makes sense. That's, that shows respect. Um, 
but then also just make sure that that you don't keep it completely quiet that there are some people that you share openly and enlist to walk with you because you need support you just need support as as a parent or a spouse or, or a loved one um so it's a both and yeah but to definitely not not allow fear of of being in a fishbowl keep you isolated absolutely it just yeah. it intensifies the pain if yeah. you're carrying this tremendous burden and this tremendous pain and you feel like you're carrying it completely alone or in isolation or that nobody knows the struggle oh my goodness and that becomes a place where the enemy gets in and um, st- just creates more havoc in your own heart it can mm-hmm. cause you to be bitter at God because then you feel so alone um, it can cause you to um, your own mental health to, to suffer and uh, we're not meant to live in isolation so you know keep parts of it private but then also let parts of it be so well known to people that, that you feel like you can trust. So we've had some listeners that we've heard feedback from over the last months um, who suffer from either chronic mental or physical illness have been really deeply hurt by people they considered safe people within the church um, just by being judgmental or uh implying or even outright saying that they must not be praying enough or they would be healed or they must not have enough faith or you know why aren't you standing up during worship when you know you you really could if if you really trusted god did you come across any of that in your own experience first of all that makes me so mad i know me too (laughs) i'm it makes me livid (laughs) angry yes um like i said the the climate at saddleback we were we have been so blessed uh, because we're a church that we have celebrate recovery here, which is a Christian mm-hmm. um, 12 step Christian recovery program. And we've had thousands of our members go through it. I feel like we created a climate of acceptance that you don't have to be perfect, that to be a Christian and to be a good Christian doesn't mean that you don't struggle or that you don't have hurts or that you don't have hangups or habits. So th- I think that has created a climate in which it's made it easier to talk about mental illness And so while there were a few people who, you know, I'm sure there were people through the years who maybe left the church or or grumbled to others that, you know, how can they be leaders when they've got a son who's mentally ill? Or how could they be leaders when they have a son who took his life? Um, And I would just say to those folks, you know what, it is not a sin to be sick. And mental illness and suicidal thoughts and ideation are part of a brain dysfunction that is not about character. It's not about weak faith. It's not about um, about being not being a good Christian. That if you pray more, if you read more verses or attend more more Bible studies or confess more sins, that suddenly it'll all go away. That that is just misinformation at best, and actually becomes heaps loads of guilt on top of already burdened people. And um, it's cruel. It's actually cruel. So while, um, while we didn't receive as much about that when he was alive, unfortunately, we did get a lot of that, not so much from our church, but from other Christians on social media and, you know, through the mail or people would write articles that, you know, somehow we were failures as parents. And you can imagine how cruel that would be for someone like Rick, who wrote The Purpose Driven Life, and to have his own son struggle with purpose and have the people who were just completely cruel, who threw that back at him and said, you know, well, you must not be the genuine article if your son um, doesn't even know his own purpose. I mean, people can be as bad as tormentors as anything that the enemy could could throw at us from unbelievers or demons of hell. Um, and and I don't think people realize it. If they did, I can't imagine they would say and do it. Maybe they would because even as Christians, sometimes we're mean. Yeah. Um, but I just want to say to anybody who's listening, that is just all wrong. It's not true. Mental illness is an illness. And the more that we understand the science behind our bodies and the science behind our brains, um, I mean, listen, what I know about the brain would, would fit on the tip of the end of my little finger. I know so little, but, but people much smarter than I am um, know that, that mental illness is, um, is a brain illness and it has so much to do with, with the way our bodies are made and the way our bodies react than it does with, you know, if you're a, what kind of a Christian you are. 
Um, I just think about in uh, Mark chapter one, where Jesus met the, the leper and, you know, leprosy was thought of as if you had leprosy, you'd done something terrible. You were, you were not a good person if you had leprosy in those days. And so Jesus had this opportunity to, to basically, you know, skewer this man and tell him, um, you know, what sin did you come? What did you, what did you do? What did you do wrong to, to become a leper? And instead the Bible says in Mark chapter one, that Jesus, when he saw him, he was filled with compassion and he touched him and he healed him. And to me, that is the way that God responds to when he meets our illness, our weakness, our fragility as human beings. His, his heart is filled with compassion and his impulse is to touch us and to receive us and to, to heal us and to, to bring that rest or that wholeness to us. So to me, the example of Jesus, I think of Ezekiel, uh, I think it's 36 and 37, where God talks to the shepherds of Israel, the ones who are responsible for the, for the spiritual care of Israel and said, you know what? You have failed. The weak ones, you've ignored them. The ones that were injured, you've left them dying and bleeding. And, and God says, so I will be a shepherd to my people and I will go after the weak ones and I will bind up their wounds and I will give them comfort. And to me, it's just so clear that God's response to the fact that we're frail jars of clay, fragile jars of clay with um, cracked pots, with broken brains and broken bodies, his response is not judgment. His response is not condemnation. His response is compassion and he touches us and he accepts us and his, his heart longs to heal us. So I just pray that anybody listening um, goes back to what the Bible says, not what others have said to you about your mental illness. That's, those are good words. Um, when, when you are facing that kind of, the kind of, um, I don't know, the kind of uncertainty in, in the area of mental illness. You kind of touched on this. While you were in, in, in the middle of it all, you maintained hope, even though you know that sometimes God heals and sometimes he doesn't. Right. How would you describe the role of prayer just from your own experience and the experience of other stories that you've, that you've heard? Um, the role of prayer in dealing with mental illness, whether it's your own or someone you love and, and how to know when prayer isn't enough and to be at peace with that. And, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I know where you're going. Yeah. Um, well, I, I always start with prayer because prayer is, is the reminder that God is my source that, that God is my, God is for me and, and God is good and God can be trusted and, and he cares about every detail of my life. So prayer is, is always first. There's no doubt about it. And, um, and so I did, I, I prayed, I, I prayed throughout every day for, for Matthew's healing and for, for our strength and for our ability to, um, to help us cope. Um, and I think that, um, you ask the question, how do you know when prayer isn't enough? Because sometimes God doesn't heal physically. I mean, I have a low thyroid and God has never healed me of that, but I take a low thyroid, a, a pill for low thyroid and my thyroid now works nicely. Yes. Um, so how do you know with a mental illness that, that prayer alone is not going to, God is not going to use just prayer to, to heal you. I think if, um, as I said, mental illness occurs on a spectrum and just because someone feels a certain level of depression or a certain level of anxiety or a certain level of grief, that doesn't necessarily, it doesn't mean you have a mental illness. I mean, that means you're human. Um, right. if, you, if you lose somebody you love, you're going to experience grief because you're a human being with emotions. If you um, lose your job and you don't know what's next, you're going to experience a little bit of anxiety and you might have some sleepless nights about it. And um, there might be some sadness that you feel. I mean, you read the newspaper, uh, who reads a newspaper? Um, you know, you look on social media, <laughs> you look at the news in whatever form that, that takes for you right. and you can be very depressed and very sad. Absolutely. That does not mean that that is a mental illness. It means you're a human being with the emotions that God created. That is, those are normal responses to sadness, to uncertainty and to grief. 
But mental illness, I would say to answer the question, when do you know prayer um, that you might need something in addition to prayer, is when those responses start affecting your daily life Mm -hmm. to the point in which you're having a hard time going to work. You're having a difficult time in school. You're having a hard time with your relationships. There, maybe you lose interest in food. You lose interest. You're not sleeping, you know, for a period of time. You have the feeling that, you know, nothing is ever going to get better. You find that, um, you know, where you maybe were a good student in school, suddenly your grades are slipping or find yourself engaging in, um, you know, risky or dangerous behavior, um, drinking too much or I mean, there's all sorts of ways when you, when you see a deterioration starting to happen in your life, that's when you need to really start paying attention and the people around you, um, that this is not just you responding to a normal, with normal emotions of sadness or anxiety or grief or depression, but somehow it's moving past that. It's, it's lasting a long time and it's starting to affect your life in really negative ways. Those are signs that you need to Um, pay attention that you probably need to go see your family doctor, you know, make an appointment with your primary care doctor and get a physical. You could have low thyroid. Low thyroid can lead to feelings of depression and fatigue. There could be something biochemically off in in your body, your, your, um, your metabolism. I mean, there's all sorts of things. And, and then your primary care physician, if it feels like it's necessary, might refer you on to a psychiatrist for a fuller evaluation. And maybe you might need medication, maybe not. Maybe you might need um, you know, some counseling and talk therapy, maybe. Um, but you won't know that if you're just sitting at home, um, letting it all just kind of happen. And I always say that, um, especially around serious mental illness, it's never fixed with just a pill. It, this is not about, oh, if you could just get, if everybody was just on medication, everything would be fine. That just isn't so. We are complex beings and we are, we are whole beings, body, soul, and spirit. And I always tell people to um, do the very best you can for yourself on what you eat. You're the one who's in charge of what you eat. So eat well, eat food that's good and healthy and you know is is um, going to be good for your body and make sure you rest and make sure that you um, are, are playing and you're finding things that bring emotional joy to you. Those are all spiritually. Make sure that you're, you know, if you're, make sure you're staying really connected to a small group or your Sunday school group or your church so that you're getting support physically and emotionally and spiritually. And if those things are not helping you move forward, if those things are not helping some of those sadness or anxiety or stuff resolve, please make an appointment with your primary care physician today and get in as quickly as you can and say, I'm just not feeling myself. That is or so your funny. loved one. Encourage your loved one. If it's, if it's your loved one or a friend, right. you know, you say, you know what? I, you don't seem yourself these days. You know, what's going on? Ask those questions. Right. Because I imagine there are times when you can't see it yourself necessarily. Yes. And so, yeah, to encourage, encourage us all to be aware. Yeah. That is good stuff. Thank you. Um, you. You have written before um, about grief and the way that your own prayers have looked through that process. And I loved that. And that was one of the big parts that I wanted you to talk about today is um, I just, I love the fact that, that you talk about how sometimes we want to shy away from the grief and the pain in, in our prayer lives, or, or even in general, we just tend to kind of cringe, but that in scripture, it's actually very prominent and that it's affected your own prayer life. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, I, I think that, as I said, my, my hope box became my lifeline of a prayer to God and uh, support to, to get through not only, um, you know, Matthew's serious illness and his, his um, decline, but when he died and I had to live with the reality of that God did not heal him here, even though I had prayed the most audacious prayers I knew how to pray, the most faith filled prayers. I knew how to pray. The fact that there were, by that time, so many people praying faith-filled prayers for Matthew. Um, It was devastating to not only to lose him, but what that did in in my own faith walk with God. And 
to be honest, that hope box, it felt like it mocked me for a while. It just, it was a mocking presence. I had it on the table next to where I would have my um, quiet time with God every day. And, and that box with the word hope emblazoned across the top of it felt like it just taunted me. And the enemy made sure that, that he got in there and, um, and had me ask even those questions just about, so God, where were you? What good were my prayers? What good did it do to be on my face before you? What good did it do to pray audacious prayers? What good did it do to quote scripture? What good did it do to write scripture verses on three by five cards and go over them over and over? What good did it do? My son is dead. Um, and as you can imagine, that was a very, very, very devastating and bleak place to be, not only just in missing Matthew, but in what did it mean for me as, as a, someone who claimed to be a, a true follower of Christ, a true disciple? Where was God? Truly, where was God when the bottom fell out in our lives? And so there was a period of, I don't think I ever stopped talking to God, but there were periods that I just sat in silence. You know, it was a good day was to get up and brush my teeth. That, that was a good day. Um, and I couldn't put a lot of sentences together and I couldn't string prayers together. And, and my prayers many times were just, you know, sobs and wailing that came from, you know, the depths of, of my soul. But all of those were prayers. Um, getting out of bed and brushing my teeth was a statement of hope that life wasn't over. Um, wailing um, from the depths of my soul was a statement of hope that God still existed and that he cared. Um, opening that hope box and taking out the verses that had brought so much comfort during the time Matthew was alive, I took them out of the hope box, not because they weren't true, but they weren't true for Matthew in the sense that God did not heal him here and allow him to walk in the land of living again in the way that I had begged and believed. And now the hope box sat empty. Not only did it mock me, but it was empty. And so there had to be a process for me over time of rebuilding hope, rebuilding belief in the goodness of God. Because with that hope box empty, it wasn't like there was anywhere else to go. It wasn't like, okay, I can walk away from God and I'll find solace over here or I'll find hope in this other religion or I'll find peace by declaring that God doesn't exist or that he's mean and he's cruel. Uh, none of those were options because I knew none of them were true. I had nowhere to go but back to God. But getting back to God in a way that increased my hope took time. I never, I never walked away and said, you don't exist. But I did have days in where I said, God, I know you exist, but I think you're mean. And um, so to that rebuilding of hope. And so over time, as I sometimes was in silence before him, sometimes screaming in his presence, sometimes wailing with grief, sometimes just barely mumbling a few words through frozen lips. Um, I just said, please take me to verses that will rebuild my hope. And the first one that went back into the hope box was 1 Corinthians 15:43. Um, where Paul says, these bodies of ours, they're buried in brokenness, but they will be raised in strength. They're buried in weakness, but they will be raised in glory. And I could believe that because Matthew's body was certainly buried in brokenness and weakness, and mine will too. Someday I may die of cancer. I could get hit by a bus. I could die of old age, but someday my body will be buried in brokenness and weakness. But I'm absolutely positive that because Jesus lives, Matthew lives, and Matthew will be raised in glory and in strength, and I will be raised in glory and in strength. 
And that cannot be taken away from me. It cannot be taken away. It cannot be shaken. It is as sure as the sun is going to come up tomorrow. And so I began to slowly repopulate my hope box with verses that I could believe, that I could begin to believe again and believe in the goodness of God and hope with everything I had for truth that I, that I knew to be true. So I would say for anyone um, facing grief or facing a loss of some kind or the despair that is so deep and feels like it's just going to fracture your soul into a thousand pieces, um, there are times you have to rebuild hope because you cannot live without hope. And there's nowhere else to go. There is nowhere else to go. There's no other philosophy. There's no other religion. There's no other belief system that will carry you through. God is the only one who promises restoration. God is the only one who promises healing. God is the only one who promises resurrection. And that's where I put my hope. Amen. That was beautiful. And I just, I know, I know that I know that there are people listening right now that need that, that need to hear that right now. Um, well, before we go, I would really like for you uh, to, to let our listeners know where you would direct them if they suspect that themselves or someone that they know or love has an undiagnosed mental illness? Well, I think, like I said a few minutes ago, make an appointment with your primary care physician. Yeah, that's a good uh, that's first step. Place to start. Um, get lab tests, get a physical examination, look at your bot, have your doctor check your body out and see if there is mm -hmm. something that might be contributing to or causing um, those that depression or that anxiety. And um, the doctor may find something right away and, um, you know, blood tests might reveal, like I said, you've got a little thyroid or something else. Mm -hmm. um, but if the doctor says, you know, um, and I realize that in many places getting psychiatric care is hard. It's just not as readily available. Some of the primary care doctors actually prescribe medication. Um, some don't. But if you need a further evaluation, ask for it and 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 get it um, and then in terms of like resources about finding out about mental illness highly recommend um, the national alliance of mental illness uh, nami n-a-m-i dot org it is a fabulous organization it is um, it's written for people like me it's not written for professionals it's not written for doctors or nurses or social workers it's just written for family members um, and you can get reliable free information it's it's this the well populated site about mental illness anything you could ask you're going to find on nami.org I, I can't recommend it highly enough there's support groups there's a family to family um 12 week training that's free that you, that you could take um it's offered all over the united states it's in all 50 states um there's um uh, my website kwarren.com i've done my best to try to fill it with um, resources, um, information, because when, when I was, you know, with, had a son with serious mental illness, it was all I could do to get through a day. I didn't know where to look on the internet. I didn't know who to trust for information. So I've tried to make my site, kwarren.com, a place where people can go and learn. NAMI is just absolutely an endless supply. But, um, but if you also can look on my site and um, find some things that, that we've collected there that I think are really helpful, resources, books, um, um, videos, um, PDFs that you can download, everything on there is, you know, meant to help educate and inform and support and encourage. Um, a couple of books I would recommend. One is called uh, Grace for the Afflicted by Dr. Matt Stanford. Really good book on, on um, again, meant for lay people to understand mental illness from a, from a Christian faith perspective. Um, Troubled, Troubled Minds by Amy Simpson. Um, Amy's uh, mom lives with schizophrenia, and so she tells, talks about it from the perspective of having an, a parent who, you know, had a mental illness. Those are two really, really good books. Um, and on my website, you know, there's more. There's more references, other referrals to other books and um blog posts and all kinds of things you can listen to podcasts you can listen to that's great are there any other places that our listeners can connect with you online facebook group or yeah facebook um, yeah facebook k warren twitter is k warren one number one um uh let's see twitter uh instagram again it's public that's k warren 75 um 
that's because I didn't know I could just put my name. I thought I had to put a number because everybody else's I saw had a number. So I thought I'd put a number. So <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah. So Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram, those are places. Uh, my, you can email me um, at k at kwarren.com, K-A-Y at, and then spell my name out, kwarren.com. I somehow, either I or someone from my team always responds. It may take us a little bit, but we always try to respond to people and uh, get back with whatever question they're asking. That's great. Well, Kay, thank you. I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your day to be here with us. And um, how can we pray for you? Oh, you know, um, grief is such a long, slow journey. It's, it's not fast. And I, I'm pretty convinced that if you lose a child, there's, there's a hole in your heart that never goes away you know, losing a child is, is definitely been the hardest thing I've ever experienced. And so my family, we're still figuring out, uh, it'll be six years in April and we're, it feels like a blink of just a blink of my eye. Yeah. Um, so you can continue to pray for us as we, as we heal, as we learn how to live again, how we learn how to process the trauma and um, the shock of, of Matthew's death. And also just to know that no, how to sincerely, how to use my time, how to use my voice in a way that brings the most encouragement to people who are living with mental illness, who are living with the effects of um, having lost someone to suicide. And and, um, I'm always in that discussion with God about how best to use my time. So those are two very real and very practical things you could pray for. Okay. Well, I'm going to close us with prayer before we go, but thank you so much for being with us. Thanks. God, we just thank you so much for Kay's willingness to be here today with us. God, we thank you that no pain is wasted. We just lift her up and Rick and their family and just pray, God, that you would be near to their broken hearts. Father, that you would lift them up every moment of every day, that you would give them clear vision and clear focus for the the very next steps to take, even if they can't see the big picture. And for Kay in particular, um, where she can be using her voice, God, and and specifically the words that she needs to share and the stories and, and the people that she needs to touch, God. Um, make that abundantly clear, God. Make her path straight. I just pray for the days that she doesn't have the energy to give, that you would just pour into her, God, with your Holy Spirit, just flooding her to overflowing with the gifts and the fruit of the Spirit. God, we just pray your blessing on her ministry on her family, on her marriage, and on just every aspect of her life. And we just lift up those that are listening now who are struggling, whether they are themselves faced with mental illness or living or or caring for someone that does. God, we just pray your healing, and we just pray for hope. Thank you for Kay's message of hope, God, that our hope boxes would just, even if they're empty right now, God, that we would have the strength to to add one by one messages of hope back into our boxes, God, by your grace and through the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, who has conquered death and who lives victoriously so that we can do the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.